In this episode of the Mama Podcast, we talk to practicing midwife Maria Roundtree about the challenges parents are currently facing in terms of language barriers when accessing healthcare, information sharing that can be improved for non-English speaking parents, and how parents with linguistic needs can advocate for themselves when accessing NHS services. Well, welcome to this episode of the Mama podcast and we are now joined by Maria Roundtree and we're going to be talking all about um, inequalities with um, parents that don't speak English. So tell us about yourself Maria, tell us about your setup at home and, and where you live etc. So I'm Maria Roundtree. Uh, I'm a midwife and I've been a midwife for uh, almost a decade now. And I live in quite a rural location um, in Gloucestershire. And I've got five children, um, although my youngest one is now 16. And I've got two grandchildren who live in Cornwall. And I'm married. I've got a husband who's amazing and very supportive of my hobby. Wow. I mean, genuinely, you don't look old enough. And five kids plus two grandkids. The youngest is the oldest is sixteen. I mean, <laughs> yes, the youngest child is sixteen. My oldest is twenty eight. Wowzers! How do you manage? <laughs> um, yeah, with great difficulty. No, they're they're dead as gold. They're, they're, three of them have left home, um, and doing all their own things. Although I think, as a mother, I think they're always your babies, aren't they? I'm sure that most of our listeners will agree with that. That you think, oh, when they're babies, you're worried about them the most. And actually, I slightly disagree with that because when they're babies, you put them down, you come back, they're still there. When they're eighteen and they're off driving around in their car, you worry about them more. Hmm. <laughs> I can't even imagine having five. Can you, Heidi? No. <laughs> no, my two are definitely enough. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so tell us about this hobby then, Maria. Tell, tell us all about your hobby and how it all came about. So I call it a hobby because um, it's not part of my paid job. So I spend a lot of my free time trying to address the inequalities for women that don't speak English. And that is because I've seen and heard stories from women that you, I just think actually they could have been very different if we were communicating effectively with them. Um, I did a fellowship last year, which was the Dame Elizabeth Annie Onwu Fellowship of Inclusivity, where I met lots and lots of amazing and inspiring people, um, including Dame Elizabeth herself. And that really empowered me to understand how to try and address this issue. But I call it my hobby because it's all done in my spare time. It's not part of my job role. So it's the only way I can justify to my husband as to why I spend so little time with him and so much time in front of my computer because I'm doing my hobby. <laughs> So tell us a bit more about your fellowship and what you've seen and, yeah, the impacts that you've had so far. So um, I was a band six midwife when I started the fellowship and I joined the fellowship because I knew that this issue around languages, by the time I joined the fellowship, I knew it was quite a complex issue and I didn't really understand how to address it in a really effective way. I had been addressing it and I had been raising it, but I felt that I could have been more effective at doing that. So I joined this fellowship, which took place in London. Um, and I had to travel three, three hours from my house to the university doors, which at first was quite daunting doing that on my own because I hadn't really done an awful lot of things on my home. Me and my husband like joined at the hip. We do everything together. So, um, yeah, it was quite overwhelming and to begin with, but then actually I really started enjoying those train journeys and I started re-engaging with poetry. I've written lots and lots of poems around inclusivity, reflecting on our lessons that we would have, um, the speakers that we have. We had um, Joan Myers come and speak to us. I mean, everybody that we met has got an OBE or an MBE after their name. They've got so <laughs> many letters that when I wrote the Rosa Report, I had to leave the letters out because I ran out of a word count. But um, so Joan Myers, we had Dame Elizabeth Annie Onwu. She came and spoke to us. We had um, Janet File, who um, is just phenomenal as well. Ruth Oshikanlu. We had Roxanne um, crosby Nairobi. I I think I've got that the wrong way around. Um, she came and spoke to us and we we talking about inclusive practice and how to make sure that we're looking after our colleagues, how to in, be inclusive for our patients. So it's lots and lots of 
issues. We didn't really have a session on languages as such, but part of the fellowship involved creating a project, which I already have my project in mind. And I joined the fellowship to get this project off the ground, but then actually gained an awful lot of insight into other issues that I'm really also passionate about. So yeah, that that was the fellowship and doing the doing the research during that. And the fellowship didn't require you to do research, but I'm just one of these people. If I read a piece of evidence, I fall down the rabbit hole of reading all the evidence that was that piece of evidence has been built on, then going back and back and back. So you end up with like pages and pages and pages of research and evidence. And yeah, I think the more I looked into this issue with the languages, the more I realized that actually some work has already been done but not implemented. And that actually the issue that I initially believed was just something that was local to the trust I worked in was actually a very national issue. And that actually, even though policies and guidelines did exist, that there were very, very little impl implementation of that. And I, I talk about accountability later, but that total lack of accountability for the lack of implementation and then the effect that has on women on the front line when we're providing women, well, supposed to be providing women-centred care. So that's that was the fellowship for me and why, yeah, where I, where I am, where I am and talking to you today. So what are the challenges um, that parents are currently facing in terms of language barriers? Um, and what are the statistics around that? Um, the, the challenges are quite considerable. So I initially started off by writing a list from a community midwife perspective of all of the challenges that women face in maternity services. And that list was four word page documents long. It was four pages long. It was like one thing after wow. another, after another, after another. It's a huge list. So it's, it is every single step of the journey. It's, Different hospitals are all doing different things. Some hospitals do things very well. Um, other hospitals, not quite so well. Um, your website was the first, and it was the first website that I could signpost my women to. So I'm incredibly grateful that you set that up. And it's, as a community midwife, working in an area of significant deprivation where women face many, many challenges, actually signposting is a very big part of my job. And even the signposting for this women, these women um, and these families is really quite small um, compared to what we can offer to women that speak English or compared to what we can offer for women that are able to advocate for themselves. So, yeah, huge, huge challenges. It's everything. I mean, even right down from trying to that first initial booking appointment trying to organize that and knowing when that should be if you're not familiar with our healthcare system and you're not familiar with our language um that's an issue right up until the point when you're breastfeeding your baby or thinking about safe sleep it's like every single every single thing in between and even down to raising concerns if you've got issues with your care it's like or all you want to give feedback that actually in many trusts that is very very difficult for women and families to do you can't you know a lot of hospitals I as part of the fellowship I was reading a piece of research that was saying about the fact their voices are very rarely heard and they very rarely complain and I, I put the piece of research down because I knew exactly why that we weren't hearing them in the complaints and I went and had a look at I think it was about 15 to 20 landing pages for the PALS service which is a patient advice and liaison service and out of the 15 or 20 that I looked at only three of them had considered the fact that some people might not speak English and of those three, only one of them had actually put how to access PALS in a different language. And of the three, one of them had said about um, to access PALS, if you, are link, if you don't speak English, please speak to your primary care provider to arrange an interpreter for you. And that angered me because as a white British woman, I wouldn't want to speak to my primary caregiver to raise a complaint because it's potentially them who I'm raising the complaint against. So I could see instantly the inequality in that. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, emergency care when women are ringing to speak to, um, you know, the maternity triage systems. There's a challenge there. It, you, quite often there's not interpreters available. There's lots of issues with the availability of inter interpreters. And I'm talking, when I talk about interpreters, I'm talking about telephone interpreters, and I'll explain that why later. 
because we we have this idea of the gold standard being face-to-face -face interpreters but actually that doesn't work very well when it's unscheduled care and sometimes what happens when we're trying to reach the gold standard is we then fail to do anything at all if we can't reach that gold standard so I really think we should be focusing on the telephone interpreters because technically it should be a 24-hour service and it can be accessed without pre-booking so that's why I talk about telephone interpreters so um, yeah ideally if we could get face-to-face -face interpreters for everybody at every appointment that'd be amazing but it's very unlikely mm. to happen so I think we need to think about our contingencies and what we do when those situations aren't applicable so um, yeah so uh, there's every it's every single barrier it's every single stage it's everything even down to knowing you know the effects of preeclampsia or the signs of preeclampsia or knowing what your baby's movement should be if we're not using telephone interpreters at their appointments how are we sharing that information and then how do we signpost to it as well so yeah it's there's a lot of barriers absolutely obviously we have the general information that we give out in the first instance and, and we've done our um information in over 20 languages now and, and we're still going we're doing the best we can but as a charity the majority of the calls that we get from our parents they're of parents whose english is not their first language um it's usually the fathers or partners that will call us and um it's mainly the digital trusts that they're in they don't understand how to access the service or they need to speak to a midwife because they've got um, some concerns or complications they don't know what number to call because they don't know how to find the trust's triage number or day assessment yeah. number in their app um, and yeah it's it's a real concern so we're then having to find that number for them and point them in the right direction and tell them that they're entitled to an interpreter ask for an interpreter when they ring yeah. Um, so that's what we're doing as as a charity. We're trying to sort of bridge that gap, but it's it's very frustrating. It's very difficult. And I think um, the issue that we have is that we have this digital technology now, which actually could really work in our favour. It's something that could be absolutely phenomenal and really level out the playing field. But even though um, I've sort of written down a list of resources and even looking at the resources, actually, it's not always obvious that something is available in a different language, even for people that, are, you know, even for charities, not necessarily yourself, but for other charities where they're trying to help and they're trying to do their bit, actually, it's not always very obvious. And the NHS website is probably the worst for it to be fair um they've got these amazing landing pages for um best start healthy start and it's got all the pregnancy information but you cannot get it in different languages some hospitals have taken it upon themselves to do that for their patients which is amazing um but it's, and some of them are using the google translate on their website which was being told oh you shouldn't be using that you shouldn't be using that but what i find when we do that is then we do nothing so actually mm -hmm. It's trying to figure out what's appropriate and actually doing nothing is never appropriate. So it's, yeah, it's just it's just such a challenge. And the other thing I would pose to you then, Heidi, is that if they haven't got their partner with them or if they haven't got a friend with them, how do they ring someone and tell them that they're bleeding? You know, how do they ring and say that their baby's not moving? And it's just it's just frustrating. And it's 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 I, I believe it could be very simple to fix. But I think it needs somebody with an umbrella view to do that. I think we should be doing a universal thing for the entire NHS rather than every trust having to spend, you know, invest in that as an individual basis when actually we could do it at, at national level and make it much more simpler. Mm. It's um really remarkable like as one person what you've managed to push forward and achieve so far and I think I probably know the answer to this but I'd be interested in your wider perspective on who you think is accountable for the current situation. So I think everyone is accountable I don't think there is a single one of us that can sit here and say actually you know I'm not accountable for this and I think it starts right with the government and the media um, and that might be a controversial thing to say, but we quite often talk about people that are refugees. We talk about words, we use words like invasion or invaded, we're being invaded. Um, and we, we use words like that, or we're being overrun. And 
those words create that bias within our society that actually really others, people that are, you know, coming to our country because that's their last resort. So I think the government needs to take some responsibility. Um, I'd also really like the government to start thinking about, not start thinking about, I'd like them to do, I would like them to add languages and communication needs as its own protected characteristic. Because right now, languages and communication needs falls really greyly within other parts of the um, Human Rights Act. If it was its own its own its own sort of protected mm. characteristic, then there would be a lot more definition around the legalities of that. So I would like to see that because also within that we could include people that have um, dyslexia or people that don't have access to um, information technology because actually we are discriminating against people because they don't have access to online resources and we need to be taking that into consideration. I just think that actually having this protected characteristic would make a big difference. I, I believe that the NHS England is also accountable because we have these policies, which I found during my sort of last 12 months of searching high and low for things. So these policies are there, the guidelines are there to put these services into place and to make sure they're accessible and that they're fit for purpose. But actually, who's implementing that? Because from the front line, which is where I am, I see a service that isn't fit for purpose all, on all occasions. So who's, who's accountable for that? You know, so... Is that a trust level thing? I'm not sure it is. I think it's a national level thing. And I, I, I believe that they spend over something ridiculous, like £40 million on interpreter services annually throughout the NHS. And I believe that that money could be far better spent um, creating a national call centre which is available 24-7, because actually at the moment it's not available 24-7. It says it is, but I've been in situations myself and reported by midwives that they've not been able to get hold of interpreters at three o'clock in the morning. Well, women don't conveniently have their babies in office hours. Women don't conveniently have emergencies in office hours and they don't conveniently report reduced movements in office hours. So we need to be really thinking about that service and what it should look like. Um, and also having it accessible, having female interpreters is really important because that's, you know, most of us would rather speak to a female and for cultural reasons, that's usually more appropriate. So so that's the accountability in regarding to NHS England is implementation of the policies that do exist, holding the trusts accountable when they don't exist, um, making sure that we are recording and reporting data for women accurately. So if they have a face of language issue, even if English isn't their first language, to ac accurately report that and then include them in the statistics and the data when we're pulling that information, having a look at what their journeys look like through maternity. Also, when we're looking at like things like the CQC reports and um, the HD reports, I know they've changed their name now, but when we're looking at incidents that have happened, it's really, really important because every time I've read a HD report or um, you know even the CQC reports, and when I'm looking at anything to do with languages, that actually the language barrier seems to factor quite far down in the list of priorities of what's happening. We focus very much on the clinical picture and my argument as a midwife is that actually quite often we look at the clinical picture because of something the woman has told us. So when you think about the leading causes of death mm. being um, deep vein thrombosis or suicide or um, you know sepsis, actually what is it as a midwife that would lead you to do a set of observations? If you're not routinely doing them, Actually, you would need the woman would say, oh, I've, I've lost, you know, I've lost a big blood clot or my leg's painful or oh, I'm worried because I haven't felt my baby move. Well, if we're waiting for the clinical picture alone to tell us there's a problem, then actually we're quite far down that clinical, mm. that clinical journey. Whereas actually the communication thing could have potentially changed the outcomes. And I think I've not really seen a report where I think, yeah, that the communication issue has been addressed in the right place in that report. So does that make mm. sense? It's like... Yeah, I'd have thought these days as well, like if you think about like what you can do with AI and data, but I mean, it would take some investment, but surely there could be something that was like, you know, like they use at the United, United Nations. It's like an instant translation. It's like you're sitting there talking the same language and there's hardly any... 
yeah. Lab, and there, there, you know? there is some research. There's a lot of research going on, and the AI has got its own issues. But it's like actually what we end up doing. Like I say, we try to raise this gold standard, and then we what we do when we can't reach it is we do nothing instead, and that's yeah. not okay. So yeah, so the NHS England, I believe, have got a quite a big responsibility in trust levels. We've got responsibility mm. to make sure our staff are given the time. Because that's in the guidelines, that's in the national guidelines to recognise the fact that if you are caring for a woman that doesn't speak English, and I'm talking like antenatal, postnatal appointments right now because you can't give them more time in labour because it's they're in labour and that's got its set timeline for yeah. that particular woman. But in those appointments, they need double the amount of time. You can't have a three-way conversation in a 20-minute appointment if you would normally struggle to get a 20 minute appointment done for a woman that does mm. speak English. So we need time. One of the things that came out on the survey that I did was the fact that people weren't given training. That is another thing that's in the national guideline that staff should be adequately trained. It is a complex communication issue that actually with a very small amount of training becomes much more straightforward. We need confident practitioners and I think if you're not using the service all the time, then actually it becomes its own barrier because you'll, you'll just become anxious or worried or maybe just not skilled um, in how to use it effectively. Um, and I will be sharing my best practice guidelines, which is a step-by-step -step guideline um, that staff can use when they're actually using the service. It's actually designed to be used as you're ringing the service. You don't need any prior training to that. But in the previous trust that I worked, you know, they did allow me to do some training and do for the mandatory training. So just a little demonstration of how it works within a particular scenario. So I think it's making sure that trusts are aware that we need to give our staff that information. And then lastly, it's us on the front line. So if we have all of those things in place and we're still not using the service, we really need to think about why aren't we using it? If we are having issues with the service, which I know that people are having issues with the service, you need to be reporting that. That needs to go to the trust because actually I think sometimes if you're not working directly on the front line, which certainly the commissioners that are paying for these services aren't working on the front line in most cases, how do they know the service is effective or ineffective if we're not telling them? So we have a, a responsibility to report that. And if it's reporting it through your incident reporting, then do that. So if you haven't been able to get hold of an interpreter at all, report it. If you've requested a female interpreter and you've got a male one, report it. If you feel that the interpreting service wasn't of high quality or that woman has told you, or sometimes partners will say, oh, they you, what you just said isn't what the interpreter said well then report that too because actually in most cases i've had really good experiences with, with interpreters they are registered practitioners in relation to interpreting services and we need to also see them as part of our multidisciplinary team because they are humans as well so mm -hmm. it's really really important that we take that responsibility that we offer the service and then when we face problems we report it and lots of the feedback that I've had because I talked to lots of people on this issue is that sometimes they say oh, well I use the service and actually I was told by a patient's friends that they said something really not appropriate and then that's so actually the service isn't fit for you know I can't use the service my argument with that is if you were taking someone's blood pressure and your blood pressure cuff didn't work correctly, that wouldn't stop you ever taking someone's blood pressure again. You wouldn't decide yeah, that you were going to include that in your practice. But actually, that's kind of sometimes what happens with the interpreter service. So you need to think about it as a part of your practice, as part of your team. You know, if you've got an issue that you're concerned about, then raise that. But don't let that stop you using it again, because actually my experience of the telephone interpreters, apart from the accessibility in the middle of the night, actually, they've been quite good. And it's allowed me as a midwife to have a really good midwife mother relationship, which is incredibly important to me. Um, so I, you know, I have a laugh and a joke with my patients that don't speak English. You know, I have a relationship. You know, they look forward to. I hope they look forward to seeing me. I look forward to seeing them. So it's, you know, that's important for my job satisfaction. You know, these women are as important to me as any other woman, and I think we all need to be thinking about that as midwives. Is this woman? Does this woman know that she's as important to me as? The woman that's coming in after her and we should be making them feel like they are valued and that they are autonomous women you know and uh, um and empowering them to safely and um confidently go through their pregnancy journey and beyond 
definitely I absolutely love that that's lovely because you know a lot of women that don't speak English don't understand what to expect either you know they've got such low expectations or standards of the service in the first place they don't know whether they're getting good care or not yeah. your step-by-step -step guide sounds fantastic so we'd love to get that on our website so um you know we can share that with other healthcare professionals I'm just thinking about um the stats and the data as well because I'm thinking about the amount of calls I get and the amount of women that you must see do you have any sort of national data of how many non-English parents there are going through the maternity services so I don't know about the non-English parents going through the maternity services in as such but I did contact the office of national statistics last year um because when the most recent Embrace report came out in October 23, I noticed quite a consistent figure really was that 5% of maternal deaths were attributed to women that didn't speak English. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, actually, I initially thought, well, I know that 0.2% or no, not 0.2% of the population didn't speak English. I thought, oh, maybe that's then that, you know, that they're they're overrepresented and um it was after a conversation with janet file and she said no you need to go and granulate your data she said you need to really look between the lines of that data because i think it's different she said but you you can contact the office of national statistics directly and ask them for data so i thought oh, that's really interesting so i did that and i sort of i contacted the office of national statistics and they sent me a tool to be able to break down the data sets so what I did is I created a data set that meant I was only looking at the number of women that were aged between 16 and 49 in the UK. And of those women in total, what percentage of them didn't speak English? And of the total number of women in that age group in the UK, only 0.2% of them actually didn't speak English. So not 0.2% of the population, 0.2% of women aged between 16 and 49 don't speak English. So therefore, that meant that Embrace data identified that women that don't speak English are 25 times overrepresented to their English counterparts. So they are 25 times more likely to die if they don't speak English. So, OK, that's only 5% of the maternal deaths. So for any women that are listening to this that is still a very small portion of the total death but actually from a professional point of view knowing that somebody has this inequality that makes it everyone's responsibility to deal with that 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 we absolutely need to be very mindful of the fact that every single encounter could be something that attributes to that the other thing that I read that was really quite um worrying was that I read the the, it was called HSIB at the time, the Health Safety Investigations Board. Um, and it was, they did a rapid review during COVID. Um, there was like a three month period where they looked at intrapartum stillbirth. So that's a stillbirth where the baby is alive at the beginning of labour and dead by the end of it. So any stillbirth is absolutely traumatic. Any pregnancy loss is traumatic. But I think to go into labour with your baby alive and then to deliver a baby that has passed away, I don't think anything in the world could prepare you for that. So but of the cases that happened within that um, three month period, 43 percent of the intrapartum stillbirths had occurred in women that first language wasn't English. So nearly half. And um, yeah, I just find that really shocking. I just yeah, I, I don't know what to say to that. So the disparities are huge in comparison it's and we have we are all accountable for that we absolutely are and until we put our hands up and say okay I can do better then we're not going to change that and that's that's absolutely not okay and I think when we talk about um black and brown women having disadvantage in pregnancy and, and in, in birth I think we all need to be accountable and aware that we're accountable for that as well I really I really hate the term unconscious bias because I feel that that word doesn't hold accountability anywhere. It's almost like a word that you just throw up into the air and it's like, well, it doesn't mean anything because I was unconscious. I wasn't unconscious when I went to work this morning. I, I never am. You know, I think we need to be taking those words away and thinking about actually what is it that's caused us to think a certain way? You know, when I've I've sat in many places where I've heard stories of black women that have given birth and their really terrible experiences. But as a midwife, I sit there and I listen and I think, 
do you know, this comes down to basic human care. It, it's not about race. It is for the it is in the because we're treating people of different races differently. But actually, it's quite simple to fix it. We just need to listen and we need to act and we need to listen to our women. That's like first day of midwifery school is that we listen and put the women at the centre of everything we do. And I think what we need to look at is why we're not putting women that are black or brown or that don't speak English. Why aren't we putting them at the centre of their care? Why aren't we listening to them? And why aren't we doing everything in our power to make sure we listen and then act upon what they're telling us? So I'm just thinking, what advice would you give those parents then on how to advocate for themselves? So you should be asking for an interpreter so when you book your appointment make it really clear that English isn't your first language that's really important so I know sometimes um people don't want to admit they're worried they're going to be discriminated against if they say that they don't speak English or um I know that partners quite often will interpret for um their their um pregnant people um so i think it's about being really clear and saying actually i don't speak english or i speak little english i need an interpreter and putting that on your very first form and then asking for double appointments that's really important because you need double appointments so i think asking for that and i know there's a lot of information around legalities of it and where does that sit and it's not particularly clear however i feel that we need to go back to what informed consent is because informed consent is a legal requirement of care and it should come directly from the patients. So I've got, I'm just going to read out the Department of Health quote on informed consent and what it means because I think this is where our anchor is going to be. So um, consent, and this is in there, this is not in their interpreting document, this is in their consent for treatment document. So um, a legal and ethical principle that valid consent must be obtained and reflects the right of the patient. Touching a patient without valid consent may constitute a criminal offence of battery. This is in the legal document. So if the patient experiences harm as a result of treatment, when informed consent has not been obtained, then they may be may be considered as negligence. So this is this is what we need to be thinking about. Informed consent should come directly from the patient. It is a legal requirement of our care and it should not come from the partner or a friend unless the patient has specifically said and it has to come from the patient that they've declined the use of interpreter services. Now, within a few documents, it says that we should still be getting an interpreter on the phone and then documenting that declining of the interpreter service because we need to hear the woman's voice and we need to also be then telling her why we're recommending an interpreter in the first place. Now, it is absolutely her right to decline that interpreter, absolutely, because that is, that's informed consent. But actually, you need to make sure it's informed consent that she's got the information in the first place to decline it. If she's going to use a partner or a friend... And um, we still need to be documenting that we've had that conversation with an interpreter on the phone and the reasons why. And then we should also make sure that we are making that partner or that friend aware of the implications of them interpreting. So we need to also keep that offer of the interpreter always open, because if they've chosen to have a friend or or their husband or their partner interpret for them, then that's their right to do so. We need to document that we've had that conversation, but we also need to make sure that that partner knows that if they don't understand something that it could have an implication on that person's care and to ask for an interpreter if they need it and also say to them in an emergency scenario um if something was happening it puts you in a very difficult position then because actually you were working as an interpreter rather than being a birth supporter because i think that's the other thing we need to think about when we don't use interpreters when we don't offer them in the first place actually we're we're putting a lot of pressure on that person that's supporting them and actually we're putting them in a position where they're in between us and the patient rather than on the rather than being an advocate for the patient I don't know if that does that make sense like we're changing yes. their role yeah. it makes um, sense. We're, we're actually working with Erwin Mitchell at the moment um on a, a web page specifically um on informed consent so um, with your help, we will get this additional information into that um, document because it's just so 
important and it's for everybody yeah absolutely it is for everybody and I think we talk a lot about when I talk about informed consent or when I talk about not using partners or friends and family without first having that conversation with an interpreter we quite often talk about like domestic abuse um, and yeah that is definitely something we should be thinking about have we got a partner that's controlling and coercive but actually I think it's beyond that I think not every partner is abusive it's about to me it's more about that vicarious trauma when we use a partner um, or and we shouldn't use children but I've heard many stories where children are used to deliver really difficult messages it's like what on earth it's yeah. policy it says don't use children but time and time again I hear stories where children like eight-year-olds are t- used 15-year-olds are used to tell their mum that their baby has got a cleft palate you know what on earth is that about um I think we need to be thinking about the fact that you know it's partners might not they don't know what they don't know if like if if English isn't your first language then you don't know what you don't know do you so I've heard of stories where women have been diagnosed with um and I share this story quite a lot because it was two things she was diagnosed with gestational diabetes and she was diagnosed with um preeclampsia or essentially a pre- pregnancy induced hypertension but they were worrying about it potentially being pre- preeclampsia and she was given medication for both and then the information was shared with her and actually her midwife saw her two weeks later and realized that she wasn't taking the medication and actually it turns out that when the person was used to interpret they didn't know what was being said and so this woman had been non-compliant with her medication she didn't know what it's for and then you know I mentioned in my presentation I did for the maternity and midwifery hour, actually our labels for our medications, why are we printing them in English if we know that person doesn't read English? Mm. That's a patient label. What's been really kind of eye-opening for me is just that, like, we've got no idea of what these women and families have been through. And, like, we're, you know, culturally as well, there can be, like, such big differences. I live in the Middle East and see, you know, just the cultural differences here and... I live in the UAE actually and there's 160 odd nationalities in kind of like my old team that I used to work in it's crazy it's so mixed and everybody's so different and I think you can't take for granted what type of care and the needs of you know people walking through the door are and like you said when you're using someone that's not impartial like a translator then you just don't know what's going to come through And so it's really powerful and yeah, just really, I also really loved it. And I'm going to have a think about this and use it because I am a diversity, equity and inclusion executive coach is what I focus on, but with corporates. And I loved it when you said about unconscious bias and saying that you weren't, you're not unconscious when you go into work because that totally just fobs off you know we've got a responsibility to be conscious and actually we just have all this like unconscious bias training and you're right it's a load of rubbish it's about like rubbish individuals on a one-to-one level and just understanding what their needs are so I really love about calling it out what it is so we're talking about racism a lot I sort of sit I follow um I've got a Twitter account which I've had for years but I've only just started using it in the last year and I follow lots and lots of people that absolutely inspire me so I've got this beautiful space that I use to sort of share my message and that message that statistic about the 25 times more has been viewed by 8.8 thousand people um so that's 8 thousand 8 thousand people at least that have seen that data might not have done anything about it but even if a tiny percentage did then yeah you um but it's just actually you know you see the stories again about racism and you the story about the liverpool hospital and they use the term unconscious bias i think what we need to do is to call it what it is and if for instance if we're treating black women differently in pregnancy or in labor and we're as there's a story isn't there about it's not true but i've heard women being told that you know actually they experience pain the same way well, where does that come from? That's not unconscious bias. If you've been educated to think that, then that's educational racism. It's not unconscious mm. bias. It's educational racism. If we haven't been taught how to identify jaundice in a, a black or a brown baby, then that's educational racism. It's not unconscious bias. If the system is failing people because we're not using interpreters, um, then that's systemic racism. It's not unconscious bias. It's never unconscious bias. It's never a conscious it. bias. And we need that language. We need that really powerful language. You know, our words, we, you know, the word is mightier than the sword. Well, let's use them 
to mm. really clarify things. Let's use it to cut through these issues and, you know, let's call things what they are. Let's, let's yeah, let's not call it unconscious hey. bias. <laughs> Can we um, hear one of your poems? Um, yeah, you could do. Um, I've written a poem about this particular issue. So um, this is a poem of stories. And when I read this poem out, this poem goes everywhere with me. You can see how old the paper is. Um, this is a poem based on stories that I've heard. So I've shared some of those stories today. But this is really to try and make um, healthcare professionals understand why we should be offering interpreters. And every single one of these verses in this poem is a different woman's voice. And that is really, really important to know that I haven't just made this up. These are stories that I've put together from those stories that I've heard. So the poem is called Hear Me. You don't know if I'm safe in my home. You don't know if I have the freedom to roam. How can I explain I've experienced harm? How will I know when to raise the alarm if you talk to my abuser to hear me? You haven't involved me in choices of care. I've not attended appointments, not known when or where. Just seen the doctor to understand the plans. Not sure what these pills are in my hand because you've explained to my child and not me. I've questions and don't have the language to ask. I have fears, but you can't see beyond my mask. Intimate issues I need to discuss, but I've come with a person I don't really trust when you speak to my neighbour to hear me. I'm nervous and don't know what lies ahead. My experience of birth just fills me with dread. I don't understand what you try to explain. My informed consent hasn't been obtained when you ask my husband and not me. For when I am hungry, thirsty or low, without an interpreter, how will you know? If I am in pain or petrified by fear, how will I know your concern is sincere if you talk through my family to hear me? Thank you. Wow. Wow, I'm well enough. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> really Thank powerful. You, but it's it's just, uh, yeah, it's the stories of women. It's not, you know, I can't take credit for it. I just put it together in a rhyming way. Beautiful, though. But I think we Maybe just need so to hear powerful. them. Mm. We absolutely need to hear them. And we need to just treat them with respect and the dignity that they deserve and not be part of adding to their trauma. And like you said earlier, you don't know what that person sat in front of you has faced. And when we talk about refugees and asylum seekers, some of the stories I've heard... I've literally, I've struggled to sleep at night. And then to think as a midwife that I could then add to that by not getting proper consent for a vaginal examination. And, you know, how traumatic would that be when you don't know what's actually happening? And mm. given the fact that these women may have experienced, like, really, regardless of what their previous experiences, that's traumatic in itself. Let's just acknowledge that. We shouldn't be doing anything without consent and it needs to be informed. But actually, you know, you're adding to it. And as a midwife, uh, my job is to do no harm. As a midwife, my job is to be with women. And for, as a midwife, my job is to do whatever it takes to meaningfully be with women. Mm. Thank you. How can people um, get involved and support you, Maria, and, and, and find you and follow you on, on Twitter? So on Twitter, I'm quite easy to find. Um, like I say, this is my hobby because as of yet, I haven't made it my full-time job. Um, I will work on that. I'm hoping to do some research next year. So I'm applying to the NIHR to do some research because I really want the voices of these women to be at the centre of everything we do for change. And the research that I do, it hopefully will definitely lead to change. That's my hope. And I will make it my lifelong ambition to make things different and make things better. And I believe there are many midwives out there that do want to do better and maybe they're not sure how to. I think there's lots of things that we can do. So I'd really love it if as midwives, healthcare professionals, whether you're a maternity care assistant, whether you're an obstetrician, whether you're a director of midwifery, to really, really think about how we make our practice inclusive for all and how what we need to do for each person to give them equitable care. Now we bounce that word around a lot, like equitable, equitable inclusivity, um, diversity. That needs to be meaningful. And just because somebody is in a tiny group, a 0.2% group, doesn't mean they're no less important. So I don't see how you can address any health inequalities if you're not including everybody within that, that 
that mm. sort of, you know, focus. Um, I'd really like the NHS England to have some accountability for the implementation of these policies and guidelines. It's okay writing them, but even as a person on the front line with 15% of my patients not speaking English, I didn't know those policies existed. So that means that we're not implementing them. You know, the midlines at the front line need to know about all these resources that are available. Um, I'd like the NHS to do change their start for life because that's a really good resource. Um, and it shouldn't be up to a charity such as yourself to be the leading people to make these changes. This is the NHS's responsibility. So either they invest in what you're doing and make that accessible to more people because of the investment, or they take accountability and do it themselves. And I think that's they should do a bit of both of that. Um, and I'd just like to, any one thing that I'd really like to do is to kind of support any agencies that work with women to raise their voice and to empower them. Um, so any anyone that can um, support me to do that, that'd be great to get into contact. Um, I'm speaking at the Maternity and Midwifery Festival in Birmingham. I've chosen to go to Birmingham because of the demographic of the patients there, because hopefully well, when I go and speak about these best practice guidelines, that's going to really benefit the midwives that work in those areas. So, yeah, and I think putting it on your website is going to be amazing as well. So, yeah, that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it does. Just to care for people, um, be caring, care and listen to the woman in front of you. I think we can hear your passion and you're like invigorated and lighted a fire in me and I'm sure the listeners will um, as well. If anyone wants to get in touch with you and can't find you that easily, then just message um, Mama Academy on socials or like contact details on the website and we'll connect you. But I think that's been excellent. Um, thank you so much. Massively appreciate it. Maybe we'll get you on in, in the next series as well. That'll be amazing. Um, yeah, lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you do. Like I said um, at the beginning of the call, is that yours was the first um, place that I could refer my women to, and that was incredibly important, that you share that information with women and that you've thought about from the very get-go of your organisation, your charity, that that's been part of your plan. So I'm incredibly proud to have been asked to do this with you today. It's probably been the most exciting thing I've done this month, this month probably. <laughs> um, so, and then, yeah, that and the um, podcast with the uh, Maternity and Midwifery Hour. But yeah, I'm just so grateful that whilst I was working in a very rural location with access to very little services, I could write your your ways to write it on the back of their notes mama academy go and have a look on here because you've got all these resources and they've just carried on building and building and building so yeah keep up with good work yeah you should be really proud of yourselves you too you're um a huge inspiration so thank you and i'm sure we're gonna do lots of things together because as you come That'd up be amazing it'd be really good i think one of the things that we're missing is antenatal education and postnatal education for mothers um and one of the things that would be really good if somebody something else someone can do is to maybe create some little short videos and then translate them into lots of languages and maybe have one you know i'm pregnant what do i do and then have that as a little podcast you know and translate it into different languages and then the antenatal education because they're missing all of that there's very little antenatal yeah, education we're actually on that as, as oh, amazing <laughs> as we speak if you need my so, help let me know yes definitely definitely we're, we're on that we're trying to get the funding for it but um yeah we're going to put lots of different subtitles in the different languages amazing so yeah that is on our to-do list oh brilliant that's phenomenal that is music to my ears because that just feels like a massive area we're falling down on yes well i i will delegate some of that to you now that i know you want to get involved <laughs> happy days well thank you so much maria it's really been enlightening and educational so thank you